Nick with Sweetwater here. Apologies for the sloppy intro, but I'm very excited to introduce my friend James Santiago and the new amazing UAFX 68 Super Lead amp pedal. James, pray tell us more about this. It's obvious what it is from the name, 68 yeah. Super Lead. Expand. Yes. Um, I, you know, I think we were talking earlier about just getting to know these amps, playing through these first sort of plexiglass historic loud amps and how do you capture the, the air and the sort of dynamics of those classic circuits, which we're sitting in front of some, some great examples here now? Because um, they are deceptively simple amps. You plug in, there's a volume and a treble bass mill and a presence. Yep. And the crazy thing is you can do so much with what they give you in front. It's like, well, put it on 10, you've got the best rock sound ever. You've also got one of the best clean sounds ever if you pull it back a little bit. Yep. Jumper, Y cable blend the two channels, change from single calls to humbuckers. I really wanted to capture the versatility of this amp from the clean sounds to the lead sounds to all the stuff in between that we got used to people you maybe using a fuzz like Jimmy. Right. Maybe, maybe just doing something different with it. So we spent a while, uh, some, uh, some great engineers we have at the office, uh, Russ Dunkel, who's actually responsible for the Dream Pedal. Right, oh, which is a great pedal. Yeah, so he, he got really into this design. We went through all these different eras of it, and we're, we're finally at a point now. We, we kind of came down to, along with a tour, you know, famous from TC. We right. all kind of put our heads together. And what could we do? And it really came down to making three versions of this amp, because you know, they all look the same. But they're different. But they're different. The, the Super Bass is different from the Super Lee, which is different than a Black Flag one, which is different than a Tube Rectified one. So. How do you make one great Marshall? Is there one great Marshall that's for me and for you? Maybe they're a little different. Yep. So we went through this just journey to go, well, let's go through them all and, and try to represent what we think people want out of what is a 90% great one and you take it the rest of the way to make it your own, hopefully, with yeah. the cabs and the mics and the Exactly. It's, you said it very well. It's a very simple amp, but the sound is surprisingly complex. There's some upper harmonics going on that are very difficult oh, to man. capture, quote unquote. And this is not a simple capture. This is not just no. a snapshot. This is an accurate emulation of the whole tone stack and the way the transformers react, oh, the way man. the bright caps, all of this happy stuff. So pray expand upon how did you guys do that? It's not just a Polaroid of no. a great setting. No, the, the crazy thing is, if I were just to take you to the end of it, the tweaks we were making as we were finishing this, were not things you would tell a DSP engineer. They were things you would tell your amp tech. Right. So I would get on the phone with Ron and go, dude, the, it's biased too cold. And then we'd bias it. And like literally, or let's move the voltage from 117 to like 115. And then bias it here. And then move it to 112 and then bias it here. And we did this for days. And I would just go back and forth with them. And those are things you do when you'd, if you had a great amp tech who would stay with you, you'd fine tune your amp to figure out well, how do I make it mine? What gives it the, the attack, but the feel with the right distortion when I put it at the seven, or do I need to cut the bright cap out? Which was a, it's almost not fair to call it a modification as much as it was a personal tweak people would have. Right. And even that alone became a hot topic because that means the amp's not stock anymore. Right. But the question is, I mean, I was fortunate enough to work for Marshall for the best part of 20 years right. and work with Jim. And what was interesting, especially the early era amps, like the plexi period, the famous plexi period, you know, right from 1962 forward, they were catch as catch can amps. Jim and his team, you know, Ken Brown and Dudley Craven, they were making mods according to what Pete Tanzen would go, I want this more graph. As Jimi Hendrix would say, I want more treble. Someone else would say, I want it a little bit more low end. Yeah. And what's interesting is way back then, component tolerances aren't what they are today. So you kind of pretty like plus or minus 15 to 20%. Yeah. So you can get three identical circuits with three identical sets of tubes yeah. as well as close as tubes can be. Yeah. 
and they would all be different because this component would be plus 12, this component would be minus 3, this component would be plus 5, yada, yada, yada. So it became a very personal thing. So oh. what's the perfect plexi? It depends on who you are. And who you are. And funny you said that because there was another week where there was one specific value in the power section where it's like, well, we only can go plus or minus 20 if I wanted to push it. So I knew I had a range where we could vary it to, to know that, well, if you had 10 of them in a row, they'd be, here's the highest part, here's the lowest value you could possibly be at. Right. And so those were, that was the last 10% to go, well, what's reality? How far can I push this to make this even better? Each little part. And I'm talking right down to picking the preamp tubes. Right. And because I had messed up one day and pulled the preamp tubes out of that black flag amp, realizing I did that 20 years ago and I made one channel a hair hotter. And I was like, man, these two channels aren't balancing the same. It's like, oh yeah, I pulled them out of an amp where I wanted one channel hotter because I was jumpering. And when you jumper, you lose a little bit going to the other channel. Right. So I gained up one tube. But those are things I'd done on the real amp right. that I was now going back through this like, oh right, I have to remember I'm tuning the real amp. And then having, the, it comes back in this pedal after I tune these which is insane. And there's boxes around here that are labeled 6CA7, EL34, Muller, GEs. Right. I had to go back through boxes of tubes. Yep, to we measured it, it to find it, yeah. And I guess proof positive of what we're talking about is way back when I had the honor of working with Kerry Kung on his signature amp, and everyone assumed his 2203, the one he called the Beast, was modified. And Kerry was like Zach Wilde back in the day. Every time the recycler is that ma magazine in yeah. LA where people put, put stuff on sale. Every time a 2203 came out, either Zach bought it or Kerry bought it. So Kerry's got a huge pile of them, so does Zach. And this one was Kerry's favorite. Now, when we took it in, we assumed it was modded, mm -hmm. but it was completely stock. But it had those component variances. And then you throw in, you know, the way components drift over yep. time, you know, 25 years later. So what we did with that amp is we, we measured each and every component. So we made a stock amp that was exactly the same as his, which meant it's not stock, it's Kerry's amp. So the question is to answer right. the question, right. what is the ultimate marshal for you? And the answer is, you could, you're the only person that can answer that, if truth yeah. be told. Yeah, and I think what we try to do is, I know what I like, and then I have to balance that with a larger group of friends. So I do have a speed dial with some friends, and I called one said, okay, 68 Super Lead. First off, do you cut the bright cap or leave it? Right. Every single one of them said, you got to take that out of there. It's a 5,000 picofarad value, meaning if you just put it on two, it's all high-end razor blades. If you take it out, um, and it actually responds more like there's another amp there under the 68, uh, the JTM 50, that amp was stock without a bright cap. And that's a black flag. That, my friends, is yeah. rare. That one there that with one, the yeah. JTM in reverse, if you will. As a negative, that's an extremely ramp. There are also 100 watt versions of that, but yes. that one I believe has a rectifier tube. It has a rectifier it's tube and, and came with no bright cap because my we started fighting over it. It's like, can I take the bright cap out? It makes it not stock. I said, but the clean sound they get out of this is usable at one, two, three, four, five. And then that's when it was like, okay, let's just ask a few folks because just to make sure that also led to making the bright cap optional. Right, gotcha. Yeah, because yeah, if memory serves me right, that would have been around mid-67. Yeah, 60, that that's, logo. yeah, that one's 66, so I'm right at the tail end of 66. Right, yeah, 66, yeah. early 67, which mean, means it's basically a JTM 45 preamp. Right. So, yeah, the it, bright cap answer is there. It's there, and then the funny thing is, I put a cap back in here, but based on another famous plexi user named Eric Johnson, who's like, well, take the 5K out, try 100 picofarad, which makes it more like, a JTM 45. Interesting. Interesting. So that's the actual option we gave you is you can put you can put a hundred picofarad in. So it's a brain trust or a, it's or a, a little tone bit, trust. A tone, a tone trust, trust, right? I call another friend, dude, you got six A sevens? And it, it's just because we all want the best Marshall. But that last little bit of how you bias it, what tubes, the bright cap going out. All those little cause there's not that much in the amp. Right. And that amp at the top there, that's your 68, which was a magical year because that was when they'd split the cathode and the preamp. Yep. I believe that has the, the lay-down transformer. Lay-down transformer. So that's as authentic as it gets, my friend, a yep. lay-down diagonal, diagonal transformer. So the question was, so how did you guys get that particular with each amp? Is it literally component by component, effectively? It is component. It, it's We start off with schematics, and Ross would essentially build it part by part by part. Gotcha. 
and then when it's almost it would be easier for him to just build the amp by hand it that's it probably, actually takes less time to do that we yeah, probably it yeah. does but you so, wouldn't be able to get it in that small box can't get it in this little box but so we, yeah we literally start with that and then it's like okay then i spend a few months looking for gold reference units now that to be told i had a closet full of the ones i've been looking around for ages uh back when it was cool to show up with a half stack you right. know um and then plus finding one that we knew was pretty much stock which that there was a period where in the last few years actually it's hard to find a plexi marshall used anymore yeah you you can't really find them really hard so i luckily found this one in st louis had another friend go check it out for me and we got it here and against the other ones it, it kind of worked out but it, it took a long time to go through marshall but then that's an unusual because every one of the friends i know have all flipped them they bought five of them kept two sold one for another one wish they had the other one back yeah it's the the never-ending quest yeah the time it, quest that never ends it never ends literally get calls like dude you have a two output super lead from 69 or certain yeah. years white panel back it's like you're still looking man yeah and you, the, that quest will never end it, it never stops but this will help you this will help you in that i think the the things we went for were very specific and tailored to what we hope is some of the classic things you would have heard done with a Marshall. Yeah, so you did the, su the super bass, which is great for the clean stuff. You heard yeah. that in a lot of Hendrix stuff. Yeah, super bass has got, the way we did ours, and funny we can go into it is, I felt one of the things that gets overlooked sometimes is just the wall voltage and how the, the amp reacts to yeah. that. So the super bass is actually at 117. Right. The 68 stock, I felt got a little nicer at 110. I know that sounds insane. Just a little bit browned. Right. Just a hair. And talking of brown. And talking of brown, we did actual brown, which is rumored to be, which actually felt good at about 90 volts. But yeah, which changed, you have to rebias. You have to rebias it. We actually did change a few things in the amp, move the mid range pot around, a few things that were possibly known uh, to have been not modified, but stock in a certain player's amp. Right. That were just inspired by, like, well, if we're going to do this, let's try the 90. And the amp absolutely responds in a different way. It is a feel thing yeah and that's hard to describe yeah it's a, the minute you get your hands on it you realize like oh there's certain things i can do with the amp in this setup that i can't do when it's just running off the wall at 117 or 120. so i know there's a lot of players who will will be happy to know that we, we did that and then half the other battle is what cab are you playing through yeah that's a huge question yeah um and some of the cabs are here i have a a set of my own cabs I've had probably 30 years or so of 25 watt greenbacks. I have some other ones that were, I'll say it, loaded with half JBL D120s and half Celestians. Well, a certain chap called Edward did that back in the day. That's right. And so that's a good mix. It's a, gr it's a, it's a great, great mix. mix. A great mix, in fact, it's an even, it's a good mix for rock. It's a great mix for a clean sound, which people don't usually set it up for. Right imagine it's like having the most hot rotted fender amp because a lot of clean players would do jbls and fenders right so then imagine a beast of a marshall which is an oversized you know its own thing but based on the basement circuit it's like its own crazy clean sound i think is like the ultimate clean sound yeah it, the police album yeah, fix as police we discussed mix. Earlier. so many players were getting these wonderful clean sounds out of a marshall so i mean the funny thing is the range of tones even if I just put the amp on five, if I just use my volume control, I've got lead, I've got dirty rhythm, I've actually got a clean. And it, there are certain songs of Mr. Edwards that you can hear him roll down the volume for a clean. Yeah, he did that a lot. Yeah. You can do that, kids. You can move your volume. You can do your volume. And, and, if the amp, well, and if the amp is dynamic enough to follow you, it actually is a clean sound. It doesn't just go turn into mud. In fact, you know what we should do? Enough talk. Let's hear some stuff. So I'm going to give you this cable via digital magic, and then we will listen to some sounds with okay. your dulcet tones explaining what we're listening to. All right. So digital magic done. James is now plugged in. Now, what we're going to start with, which yeah. might surprise you, is he's going to play clean, and he's using the same exact setting, the brand setting I played in with, with my klutzy playing. Let's check oh. it out. I think you might be surprised. Take it away, my friend. All right. <laughs>
Did you see what he did there? Very clever. He touched his volume control to wind it back so it went clean. That was quite remarkable. I'm impressed. Those are expensive chords you play, by the way. Too, there, but. there, I have a... I'm running a tab somewhere. I've yeah, stole them all from somebody else. But Eric Johnson and Jimi Hendrix, you owe a lot of money to at those respective bars. Of, a ton yeah. of money. But the crazy thing is, you know, it's a, it's a dance you do with the guitar, but only if the amp can do it with you. That's correct. Yeah, you've got to have a good dance partner. The dance partner, because I can do this with a bunch of other gear, and it just goes, falls away. And the fact that I can actually lighten up my touch, I can move to this, which is actually, um, it's just not really a humbucker. It's called a wide range, but not that hot. It's hot enough to, I can yet get an actual lead sound to bloom. Right. I can play soft and play with my thumb and you can hear it. That's, and I didn't touch a single pedal. I didn't move a single knob. We literally just moved the cable over. Yeah, and the, what I can say is that it's, it's hard to maybe get on video, but you could feel the movement. There was a third dimension to those sounds. There's a bloom on the high end that's beautiful. Those harmonics are there. It leaps out at you. It's it, not a Xerox of anything. No, no. Um, you, can, you can see the brush strokes, if you will, if it were a painting. Yeah, and the weird thing when you if you step back, it just looks like a, honestly a single color. And when you when you, when you see cl up close, you realize like the imperfections of where things are. And we look at a lot of times at the, the harmonic series. Right. And the weird thing is, I can hear things that are distorted, and don't have the correct harmonics because it just sounds kind of flat and dull. Right. Um, and I, I sometimes take um, like the woman tone, the Clapton woman tone. It can be woolly and dark. But because the harmonic series is there, you actually still hear it cutting. Right. If that's not there and it's just woolly and dark, it's just mud. Yep. And that's where a good dance partner, meaning your amp, right. comes into play. It comes into play because I can turn down the presence and make it dark, but those harmonics are still up there. Yep. And my ear feels like I'm not kind of in a claustrophobic little space where it's just this window that's all these other notes. It's like sometimes when you talk to engineers about, well, I go through this tube and I use this transformer and this console. Because it's like it's, it adds other notes. It literally does. Yeah, it does. You're hearing more than one note. Yeah, and, and in a perfect world, if we sat here long enough, I could hold a D string open, and we should be able to hear the harmonic series kind of... I won't torture you by making that go very longer, but yeah, much no. longer than that, but you would you would hear all those notes in there. And there's the also concept that uh, some players, when you play power chords, you actually hear a major third. Right. Because the harmonic series is actually putting a phantom major third in there. Interesting. Which again, uh, we're not going to make this a science lesson, but it's crazy when you do this the correct way that all this little stuff starts to make a difference, just like with the real amps. And the great thing about this is that, and I can say even with my dodgy playing, is it feels really nice. And to me, a great amp is a symbiotic relationship yeah. between yourself and the amp. So it makes you want to play more because you're feeding off what you're getting from the speakers. And I get that from your little box, so oh. thank you for that. Oh, I'm glad. I got to thank Ross because uh, I, there, I might have talked about this a little bit, but like the first day I turned in notes when we had this running was, it was fighting me. It's a little hard for me to cut through it. And he's like, "Oh man, you're right. It was a uh, uh, actually one thing off in the bias of right. the thing." And in the power section, he's like, "Oh man, you're right. It was sputtering." I'm like, "Yeah," because I could feel it. It was not tracking. So sometimes what I do is have an A B switch and listen to the prototype hardware, and then just switch over to the real thing. Right. And and if you, at some point, if I can do that switch, and I start to get lost in which one I'm on. You've won. You've won. It doesn't you've have won. to be perfect. You and your team have won. You've won. And at some point, if I just like this thing better, I keep coming back to this, because you start pushing it the way you want it, that's like, okay, great. You know, I'm still never, you're not going to get these amps out of me. No. I'm never going to sell them. No, you shouldn't. I can't sell them. They're my wrong. babies. That would be wrong. Be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, you but don't sell your children. Yeah, you don't sell your children. I mean, well, well, yeah. well maybe. But, maybe. But not yeah. those. Um, not those. Joking yeah. aside. Hey. No, <laughs> joking good. aside, the thing that's great too is that I like to me the test of a good amp or a good anything is it makes you want to play and you lose yourself. Yep. I lose track of time. That. And I don't want to stop because I'm enjoying myself. So I become one with my guitar and my amp um, and that's that's the ultimate goal ultimately that is 100%. if you're fighting something you're losing so it's like this sucks i've heard amps that sound great when other people are playing them then i'll plug in and go eh, yeah well, get me out of here we had that happen to some of our, our guys well, one issue in particular in a 
few other ones, when we got them running to a point where we wanted people to listen to them, one of the things we got back was, oh man, I started playing it and an hour went by. Yeah. And that's when you know like, okay, I think we're going somewhere good. Yeah. And because really, there's not that much to it, but I, I think the fun for us was was making sure we could cover the app. So like right now, we're just staying on this browned out Marshall. And like, if I move the amp around a little bit, the tone stack, switch to a different cab and a mic. Why don't we do that? And we can do that, yeah. Um, right now, we've been on this sort of mixed JBL Celestian thing. Which makes sense because of the Variac and Edward. As you said, yeah. if you look closely at the pictures of the first album being made, there are two mics. Yeah, and, and that's what's in here. It's a, two SM57s, one's on a JBL, one's on a Celestian. And that's and it's a kind of nice blend of those two which is how I'm getting this great clean sound that also isn't sterile. There's actually some meat under it. Right. Um, if you listen to a JBL, it's kind of all high end because of that sort of silver dome right. cap. But um, one of my favorite ones is actually the cab you're sitting in front of now. So I'm going to go to the top red. And when I go to this cab, which is a 68 basket weave vinyl gone. Yep. Um, this Thank one you, was Mr. A, B, by the way. Yeah. And, I, and I, there is a good story to that. Um, but I'll, I'll play it first so you can hear the difference. So when I go to this cab, I can immediately use a distorted sound and it'll get you that. Yeah, I recognize that song. Yeah, that yeah. kind of, it just has that. It's there. And it gives me that sort of. It's sort of that cross between Beck, Hendrix, Page. Now, the one thing I can do to this as well is, which we were doing when you were playing, is there is a boost that's very specific to, to the pedal, which is also based on having an echoplex. Right, the EP3. Exactly, EP3. Right? And the one thing about an EP3 is it's, people say EP booster. Well, there's no actual booster in there. It just kind of passes through it. Right. And depending on which EP you have, some actually add a couple of dB, some cut. Right. So in this case, we I liked the one that had actually added about a dB and a half, two dB of gain. So that's what's in here. So I can engage that and immediately make this even bigger sounding. And there's also a part where the boost, if I turn it up a little more, it starts to give you this little mid-range bump, which, which was a GE10. Right? A GE10 for another player, you know, depending on how the amp was reacting, you could start pushing this up and the mid-range would open up that sort of vowel-less sound to your right, tone. So you roll off the lows and the highs yep. and get that. Get that. So, so if I do, I can turn this on and slowly bring that in. So I'm going to just stay on this sound. So here's without it. Turning on the EP. Yeah, it starts to thicken. It's thickening and woolly. If I turn up like noon, now I'm going to get a mid-range boost. If I turn it off, it's going to be real noticeable. So that, you're almost leaning into that sort of violin tone Clapton meets Eric Johnson thing. Beautiful. Just by turning that on. But still, it's... Yeah, so front-ended Marshall. It's a, it, that's all it is. And I can go there just by changing the cab. Right. So this cab is really unique because I wanted it, one, because it goes with the year of that amp. Two, I thought it would be really cool to find one with the ripped vinyl off of it, which is a big ask. Right. And then I, I was hanging out with a friend one day going, man, I really need to find some basket weave 68s. He's like, well, call me tomorrow. We as a famous rehearsal studio and in Burbank called Third Encore. Right. A lot of band, I mean, you actually can see, you would see ACDC walking around the parking lot right. or the Stones. Um, so we were having a hangout there one Friday and it was Joe Bonamassa. We were sitting there, he was done rehearsing, we were hanging out at the table. I said, hey, what about those baskets? Like, what I really need is a slant, 68, basket weave, ripped vinyl, and he literally goes, hold my beer. Goes across the concrete parking lot to, he had a storage locker on site. Because he used to rehearse her a lot. So this is jokes. Yeah, yeah. He, I see him five minutes later dragging that thing <laughs> himself across the parking lot. There you go. Come get it. Drops it, load it into my truck. He's like, there you go. See you later. Wow. 
And this isn't relic. This is the real deal. Look at that. That is it's the real deal. Beautiful. And it, apparently used to belong to Kevin Shirley. For, he had it since the 80s. Oh, wow. So he's the one who did all, or he may have got it this way, but. Gotcha. So who, Kevin is, did a lot of, Kevin's known for producing Iron Maiden and a lot oh, of. Yeah, he's done some great records at this time. Yeah. So they, so Joe got it off Kevin. Joe's been hiding it. So I got it off Joe for now. So, but it's just a great story of you. You're, I just really need this very specific thing. And to literally just five minutes later, someone's dragging one across the parking lot. That's well, a great backstory. And that, so it's the perfect combo, like with that one, though, with the yeah. lay down transformer. The later transformer. Perfect. And, perfect. and it, it's, that's not even the craziest part of the story. Go on. Is I, then I put it in the studio and I mic it up and find out what, what mics pair good with it. And I was telling him, look, man, this cabinet really likes uh, an M160. If you don't know what that is, that's a, a buyer ribbon mic. Okay. That I first heard of when I was asking Eddie Kramer what he used to put on Hendrix's caps. Uh, yeah. So he okay. said, like, are you experienced? Was a, a silver buyer M160, and and from that this was twenty something years ago. I bought a pair from Europe. They were silver original sixties ones, and for some reason that also with a little fifty seven is what that cab liked. And I told you, I'm like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm finding it that M160 and fifty seven really is like that's really scary because that's what Kevin used to put on there too. Get out. That same mic paired. M160 and a little 57, maybe a 41, but mostly M160 and 57. I'm like, well, that's weird because that's what this cabinet likes. And that's what's in the box. And that's what's in the box. Yep. Wow. A tone nerd conference had to happen to go like, hey, you got one of these? You know, how would you set this up? So, you know, you, you call your friends who are all into, because if you're into these amps, you're usually really into these amps. Yeah, which means it's got to be paired with the right cabinet, with the right speakers. With the right speakers it. and the right mics and yeah, the everything. And then we're going to get to a point later where we may talk to some friends that got to be paired with the the right PAF. Right. Yeah, it's never ending. The it's tone, never ending. The Tone Quest rabbit hole of doom. It will never it ever end. So we so far we've heard the brown with yeah. the green back with the mix. So let's let's go to the other one, which is actually the th the thirty watt green back. Yeah, I can go. I'll leave this setting here. So here here's your references. Here's the top. That, here's. You're gonna get a little bit more high end staying out of it. The bottom is where we ended up with the JBL and Celestian mix. So there's that sizzle. Right. Now I can keep going. Here's another fun one. This is a single uh, speaker cabinet uh, and it's an EV12L. Oh, really? Which I thought would be fun. <laughs> Now that the, changes its character completely. That's it cool. does, and there's a weird phenomenon that happens when you have a single speaker driving room as a, uh, compared to having four, because the four actually do interfere with each other. Right. So there's a weird Comey mid-ranging that happens in a 412, because they're all a little bit, you know, the distance from each other plus firing into the room. A 112 with a Marshall is way more like studio focused. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you imagine taking your amp and loading it down and being in an ISO cab with just a single 12, it's very right here. And you get this extra cabinet, well, you get three extra cabs. You get three extra when cabs you when, you, when you register, yeah. yeah. So this that's is one of them, so what's, what are the other? The next one, uh, D65s, and a 212 cab. Completely different sound again. And the last one is, because we've talked about Greenback 25, which are typically, you know, G12Hs. Right. Let's talk about that. But everyone loves a V32. Yeah, I love V30s. V30. So the last cab is a V30. Now, I doubled down on the V30s sort of punch by doing it with 414s. And the 414 FKG mic can actually handle a little bit of low end if it stays tight. It does a little bit of a, a little, little mid-range kind of removal on that mic. So, which again, funny, if I play a little lighter and put a reverb on it, it's also a fantastic clean sound. And you did that just by turning down the volume on the guitar, which is exactly how that amp would react when you did that if you were plugged yeah. into it. And that's a testament to just how much work you put in and how well it's paid off, because that's quite remarkable. You can't do that with a capture. It's hard to do with a capture because a lot of times, you know, the amp's going to react a certain way. Plus, that amp um, this is something that we don't think about a lot, but 
the brighter the cabin it is, the less I have to push the treble on the amp. Right. And when you push less treble on an amp, at least in these amps, they distort a little less. Right. Because really, like, if you put them all on 10, everything's distorted. So it's a balance of, well, if I use a bright cabinet, then I can pull the tone stack back and the amp won't be so, you know, so distorted. So that's when you play with them, meaning the darker the cab is, I can put all those controls on 10, get the most distortion out of the amp without having too much trouble. So if you can balance it by going, well, I want all the distortion, so I'm going to just put the tone stack on 10, and then I can just use a darker cab. And then you go, well, a darker mic, because maybe that's the cab you like. You just want to shade it out right. a little bit. So it's, a, it's the old balancing act of when you used to have to do this in a studio, you would audition three or four microphones, right. two or three cabs. I, I actually listened, when I got this cab and all of the cabs in here, I listened to each one of the speakers individually. So I take the mic, put it in the same spot in each one, mark it, make a little map, sonic map of it, and I know the top left is mid-rangey, the bottom right has no high end, the top right has no mid-range. They all, I've never seen one single 412 that had all four speakers sound identical. That's the ultimate tone of geekishness. Thank you for doing that, by the <laughs> way. Thank you for doing that, because once again, the results are in there. It's in there, because otherwise, we'd, we'd, we'd just have, it would be pure luck to go, why didn't my gear sound good today? Because maybe you didn't realize, like, well, the engineer put the mic on the bottom one right, that day. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, all speakers are not equal. They're not. they might say the same thing on the back. Right, so that, that's another one of those things you realize, like, man, I have to listen to each one of these. And there's no right or wrong. There's just sometimes what that amp likes. Right, so we've heard, we've heard all six cabinet combinations now, but we've yet to hear the yeah. super bass and the super lead. So if you could quickly right. give us a demo of those two you things, that'd it. be splendid. And I'm going to go back to the stock cab you're sitting in front of. So here's our. I'm going to put the amp on five. And this is which amp now? Super bass. So I'm, I'm going to go Varac, and then I'm going to Varac Brown, and I'm going to push us up into stock. Okay, gotcha. So gotcha. you can hear where we're at now. I'll just stay on these single coils. <laughs> And here's stock 68. It's still great, but a it's little different. bit of the, that compression and the high end sizzles different. It's, yeah. a, it's a different beast. See, and now in this case, I want to start blending channel two and to, to take some of the shrillness out. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And, and there's a whole technique to how, if you look at that amp now, it's technically jumped. jumped. Yeah. And then I would, if I Y cable in, I would be going here and then going equally through both. So the the pedal auto Y cables and jumps for you. Right. And so, a, what people, if people don't realize this, there's a difference between jumping and Y cabling. Because when you Y cable, yep. when you say why do you Y cable, it's because you're sending the exact same signal mm -hmm. to both channels. Both you're channels. not getting a slightly different one going to the second channel when you jump. Right, because if we jumped it, you can see like on that one, I would go into the top of one, it kind of goes through the circuitry a little bit, comes back out and goes the bottom of one and it goes into two. Yeah. So you end up with an attenuated, darker version going into two. Yeah, so it's not quite the same. They're not identical twins. They are not, but it sure is cool when you see Jimmy with jumpers and amp. To yeah. amp oh, no, to it's amp. all good, but it just gives you another tonal option. Yeah, and it's so, there, which is great. And it's there, and in the app, you can decide whether you're Ying or jumpering. So yeah. in this case, I'm Ying in. So I'm going to start bringing in channel two, and you'll hear the amp sort of get better. Oh, yeah. And there's the, there's, now it's. Ooh. Yeah, and there, all the bottom the from best the best of both worlds again. Yeah. Right? If I put them on seven, both on seven, start using a humbucker. Still dynamic. And you've you've also modeled ghosting, transformer ghosting, which is <laughs> once again the ultimate You can hear that. Yeah, it's it's great though. That was a very hot topic because some amps do it more than others. Right. Some amps are worse because you never change the filter caps. Right. And it depends where the transformer is relative right. to everything else as well. There's a whole manner of things, but yeah. it's a thing. And it's can, a thing. And, and it's, it's a great thing sometimes. And it's a great thing because we, we get out of the wall with alternating current and it generates 
this stuff in the power section, which one of them is this sort of 120 hertz sort of sort of thing down at the bottom, as well as what I like to call these little teeth. Right. So if you if you play one note here, around that note is a, a little bit of an out of tune note below it, a little more out of tune on top of it, or intermodulation. And that's what gives you that ring modulatory sound. Mm -hmm. And if, if I play some high notes up here, you're gonna hear a if you listen for it, that rub. That yep. There's a little bit of a sour rub yep. under it. It's there. And you can go into the app and remove that. You can decide. Now, the thing was, the fight was, we figured out a method to take that out without changing how the compression and the, the sag of the voltages work. Because if you take it out completely, the amp doesn't respond yeah. the same. Because now you're taking out the reality of yeah, how the current broken, hits the plates. You've broken the amp. You've broken. You've, you've basically, you know, sterilized your amp. So there was a method at the very end. Like, look, how do we do this without, you know, ruining the feel and the sound? I still want the transformer to squeeze. I want it to. I want that pilot light to virtually dim when I hear it. Because yep. anyone's on the Marshall, if you put that thing on seven or eight, you look back at your amp and hit an A chord, it goes. Yeah, yep, that's because it can't, the, that, there's a sag. There's a sag there, and you see it in the LED, yep, going, your pilot oh. light. It's like, oof. Yeah. So we figured out a way, essentially what it's like is having your your power section run like a, on a battery. <laughs> Almost like that. Right. So it's right, a direct right. current thing. So it, it gave us the feel without changing that and, and removes that. And again, you can do that in the app. Right. You can you can take the bright cap in and out. You can decide to get rid of the ghost notes. Um, I'm leaving it on for now, but... You know, it, it's one of those things where because we have a little bit of leeway on, you know, we want this to sound like that, what they call warts and all, but then why not give you a few little extra goodies? Like, you could just have the sound of it without a couple of these things. Maybe you want that. And you also have the room control as well. The room control is great too. Now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave us here. In fact, I'll start again. I'll, I'm going to go quickly through all three and then I'll crank up some room on this. So, so now we're going to go back to brown which now has jumpered where right. channel one and two. Stock and then super bass. Now, oh, super bass is so big, away. I don't need the jumpering anymore. Yeah. So yeah, I so pull that out. that channel two out, yeah. Yep, I'll go back to channel one, and if I just hold this, uh, stock. Yeah. There's our, and that's the same setting. Yeah. So it progressively gets cleaner the closer you get to the super bass. Right. And that's one of the things you find is if you're just looking for clean headroom with no bright cap, because those amps did not have one to begin with, right. that's why people are like, it's a great pedal platform. Because it's big, clean, you can turn it down without hurting yourself. Right. You know, but then again, you know, I, I have no problem leaving the amp on any one of the modes and just smashing them with fuzzes or, right. or yep. things. Now, if I go back to this, I'm going to go to the stock mode. We'll do the jump ring again. And I'm going to go into the alt mode, and there's that room there. So if I do that and add a little EP booster thing with the GE10. It's almost like you're in a really sort of live cutting room. And what is the room you've you dynamically modeled? So I did the most research in room modeling using our Studio 610. Okay. Um, it's it's built into our facilities in uh, Scotts Valley. Okay. Um, and that was based on some classic designs of Western studios that was part of a Bill Putnam's original designs that were Ocean Way and Western gotcha, United gotcha, Western. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's a small version of that. But to be quite honest with you, the, the thing that set me off to having room was some dissection of Hendrix Masters many years ago, where these sessions were held at Olympic Studios, which is now long gone. Uh, but if you look at, there's a Stones documentary on, uh, I think it's Sympathy for the Devil. That's that same room, Olympic Studio. It used to be used a lot by the Beatles and Stones. Right. And, like all of our experience was done there. And then in, in, in archiving some stuff w with that estate and remixing some things, there was only four channels. Um, so there was drums and bass on one. You know, there was guitar. There was some vocals. And then there was random stuff. Right. 
So there was a specific tune called um, Axis Bolt of Love. Remember it? Well, great tune, big clunk, A chord starting thing. And when I uh, was listening to the tapes coming up, only the drum and bass channel was up. And that guitar was just as loud in the drum and bass channel. So that was room effect. It was room. His guitar was on the other side of the room, but loud facing the drum overheads. So what gave you the depth was 30 feet away, that Marshall hitting the overheads. U67 is likely in, in that room. And because the minute I, t I listened to the beginning of that song with just the guitar soloed with the M160, it lost the depth. Cool. So, and you can do that here. Like if I do that same kind of uh, chord here, just a... I mean, that's cool, but if I turn the room up... Yep. That, that. Without it, you know. Now, you don't have to turn it up that loud, but having a little bit there... It's just that little bit of thing thing that makes your ear go, oh, I'm I'm not in a closet. Yeah, it's wider. It's a reflection. And it's not a, it's not reverb, it's not it's just enough of a few bounces but through a you know glass bouncing off a nice wooden floor right. with a little carpeting. Yep, yeah, I won't tell you the it. depths I went through to go crazy with the sound of carpet, which was a thing. Well, I can't thank you enough for making this because I had a lot of fun playing this coming into it and I know I'm going to have a lot more fun afterwards. So James, thank you thank to you. you and your team thank for you doing Nick. this. And by the way, that tattoo says it all. Right there. That's you got to respect the man. Right the there. man, the myth, the legend, the legend, Jim Marshall. May he rest in peace.